So as we were talking, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that we can endure it. And it's interesting today, because what I want you to do is to think about how we face this door of temptation. And I'm going to get two people to come and help me today. There's two things that I want us to focus on. First of all, so Ray and, and Abby, come on up. Everybody say, hi, Ray and Abby. Uh, Ray and Abby are, are kind of heroes to me. Um, they are looking after, they took their summer and said, hey, we're going to come and look after a bunch of teenagers all summer. And they're looking after staff care at Joy Camp. I had the, I've, I've known, I ran into Ray a couple times before this. Is this your first year at Joy? Yeah, Abby's first year at Joy. And uh, I got to know them when I was speaking at Joy uh, the first week in June, July, whenever I was there. Anyway, so they're going to help me today. They, they're an amazing couple. They're actually engaged to get married next summer, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so everybody say congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to have you stand on this side, and Abby, I want you on this side. And I'm sorry, like, I hope you, I, I picked some younger people because they got to stand here for the whole time. So... <laughs> I, and I originally I thought, you know what, I wanted props, I wanted like a physical doorway, but I thought about it too late in the week to actually pull that off, so I thought, well, when, when, when we're tempted, we're actually facing a person, and, and or, uh, you know, like a being, and, and when, and, but this invitation, it's also an invitation to uh, another being, and so I want us to think about this as a doorway, or a uh, uh, you know, coming to something. So you're going to be temptation. <laughs> yeah. He's, he said, when I told him he's going to be temptation, he said, should I unbutton another? <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and, and, and Abby's going to be invitation. And when we think about this, when we think about this as we face the door of temptation, a lot of times uh, we think that we probably don't have any power in of ourselves that there's just no other choice for us to, to avoid this door, to avoid moving in this direction. And, uh, and mainly that has to do with, because we have some very bad identity theology in the church. Namely, that if you and I, as we are here today, we all know that we've been saved by grace in, in, Jesus, in Christ Jesus, but most of us have heard, I know I did, I grew up with this, I heard it time and time again, you are a sinner saved by grace. And that was my identity. And it is true, right? I was a sinner saved by grace. Kevin Martin was a sinner saved by grace. Carl Bauman was a big sinner <laughs> saved by grace. Lloyd, Lou, Aaron, Donna, my mother-in-law, Believe it or not, like that just blows my mind. She was a sinner <laughs> saved by grace. But, yes, we were, we are sinners served by gra- saved by grace. But that is not the end of the story. Yes, that is what we came from, but if that's your identity that I'm just a sinner saved by grace. So when it comes to temptation, I have no choice. I'm just going to keep going through this door. I'm going to keep moving through and moving through. If that's your identity, then that is probably your story. I'm just a sinner saved by grace, and I have no power over this. But that is horrible identity theology. Our enemy uses this to condemn us. And based on... Yesterday's events, my attitude, my actions, he says, need I remind you? And we talked about this last week that he condemns us and he goes, you idiot. And you go, yeah, I am. You know, you, you're worthless. Yeah, I am. And I can't believe you did. I know I can't believe I did this too. And that is this sinner saved by grace mentality. But God doesn't agree with that. 
That is not who you are in God's eyes. God declares you were a sinner saved by grace, born into a brand new life. You are a new creation. And Jesus Christ, because of what he did on the cross, you are a new creation. The old is gone, the new is come. Yes, your flesh still is corrupted and your mind still needs work, but you and I, we, we might still have the capacity to sin, but hear me, that's not your identity. Your identity is that you, as Paul says, you are a holy one. You are a saint. <laughs> when I stop and think about it, I'm like, my mother-in-law, yeah, that's a saint. Me, that's a little dicey. But, but, this is who you are in Christ. In Christ, you are forgiven. There is forgiveness for all sin, past, present, and future. And you have a right standing in Jesus Christ. You are clothed with his righteousness. And God sees Christ when he sees you. That is our position. Yes, that is our position, and we have this progression that we have as we walk our faith out, as we grow in the maturity, as we grow and mature in Christ. But again, we are saints in Christ. And so I ask you today, when you are faced with temptation, do you have to go through the door? And for you and for me, it depends on how we see and how we think. I am a sinner saved by grace. That's who I am. That's what I do. Sin comes, so let's go. Let's do it over and over and over again. And you just keep going through the door. You keep going through the door. You keep going through the door if you see yourself only as a sinner saved by grace. And God is saying, no. You need to win the battle for your mind. You need to win the battleground, the battleground of your thinking and start understanding in Jesus Christ you are made new. In Christ, you are a holy one. In Christ, you are a saint that has the capacity to sin, that has the capacity to miss the mark. And sadly, I do that. I think we all do. But it's not who I am. And some people go, okay, wait a minute, Steve. Paul says that he was the chief of sinners. Yes, he says that. Paul is saying here, he said, if you want to line people up who could not make it without grace, who could not make it apart from the grace of God, put me at the front of the line. If you want to find people who needed God's grace to cover their sin, put me at the top of that list. But Paul's story and the way that God used him was to put a comma at the at the end of that phrase, and unpack things like this. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are, though, we are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us were baptized in Christ Jesus? We were baptized into his death. And we're therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too live a new life. And friends, that living a new life, that's God's desire for you. That's God's desire for me. And friends, this is where victory starts. It starts in our minds. I am a son of God. I am a daughter of the King. I am a new creation. I am in Christ, and Christ is in me. That term, I am in Christ, and Christ is in me, Paul references that 169 times. <laughs> That's a lot. <laughs> 169 times Paul talks about being in Christ, and Christ in me. Does that mark you? Does that define you? Is that your identity here this morning? I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I am filled with the Spirit. I have the power of God's Word at work in my life. And I do not have to go through this door anymore. 
No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind. And our God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Everybody say, way out. God provides a way out. Again, God provides a way out. And we need to pay attention to that. Because this spiral, these thoughts, and last week I said this, and, and it hasn't left me, and, and I had a friend say the same thing, that we cannot think, when it comes to sin in our lives, we cannot think that we're in control of every thought that comes in front of us. Because our enemy uses thoughts, and that's where it begins. And when we do follow the thought, when we move in the attitude, the action, or move in this direction to this door, and let's say we enter and come in behind, I'm, God is faithful. There's a way out. If you look for it, if you are aware, and I'm going to ask you today that as you think about this, as we think about deep clean and our hearts and getting rid of the darkness in our hearts, and sin plays such a big part in this, that when we are tempted, and then if we do, if we're like, okay, I walk through the door, uh, don't just keep going. Look for the way out. And we're going to talk about that a little later, but God is faithful and will provide a way out. Look for it. I have never been to England. Maybe someday I will. And uh, I was listening to, I can't remember who it was that was talking about this. And, uh, and they were talking about the subway, and I wish we did this in Canada. In, in England, in their because I guess it's pretty complex, the, the, the system, for anybody that's been there. But they have these signs. I should have got one on, from Google. And when you need to get out, there's a sign that says, a way out. And it's so simple. And I'm like, well, there it is. And apparently you just keep following the way out, a way out, a way out, the way out, the way out. You go up this, go up this. It's just the sign is there all the time. And I believe God does the same thing because he's faithful. And if you look, there is always a way out. But the biggest way out is not to enter in the first place. <laughs> the biggest way out is to not go in. Is to recognize, okay, this is where this is headed. I'm taking that thought captive. And the biggest way out is to actually move to the invitation that is before us. I mean... You stop and think about this. We're preached, we've heard from the time most of us we were this tall. You know, here's the gospel. Don't sin. Don't do it. No, 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 no. I heard that a lot growing up. And that's been our gospel. And we, a lot of times when we think of God, it's like, well, God's all about don't do. He's all about no, no, no. And actually, the no's in Scripture, the don't do's in Scripture, they are, God's like, it's not because he's trying to ruin our lives. It's not like he's trying to make sure that we have no fun. The don't do's are there so you can do something. The don't do's are there so that you can have a life and move in what God's called you to. All of us, if you're sitting here today, I'm convinced of this. You have parents that were don't do parents because you're here. <laughs> right? Your parents said, don't cross the road. Okay? Don't stick the fork in the outlet. Right? Don't, you know, <laughs> don't just blindly jump off of a building. Right? Like, that's dangerous. The fact that you're here and living is because you had parents that said, don't do. Because they recognized that there's a whole bunch of do that you needed to do, and if you did some of the things you don't do, you won't be here to do what you need to do. Follow? God's the same way. He has so much for us. So much that's fuller, bigger, more than we can even understand. And he's like, 
don't do this, and then you can do all of this. But we get stuck over here, and we don't look at the invitation, because the invitation has been there. And we have to recognize that it depends on which door we focus on. You see, the message is not victory by saying no to temptation. I believe the message is victory by saying yes to the invitation. Going back to the garden. Think about this for a moment before everything went south. Where this all started, before the temptation came, there was an invitation. Walk with God in the cool of the day. Made in the image of God. To have relationship with God. To know God and be known. To do God's work on earth with God. The invitation was come, walk with me. Know me. Experience me. It was intimate and connected. And that was the first invitation. That was the first gospel. And I believe it's still the gospel. This invitation where we go, okay, I'm walking towards this door. I'm going through this door. I'm entering in here to be with Christ, to grow in Christ. Some of you, will not experience victory in your life because you've never said yes to this invitation. Some of you have not crossed the line. And I wonder today if today is that day that you cross the line. I love how simply Paul puts this for people in the message in Romans, oh, it says New Internet, but the message in Romans 10 When it comes to us moving from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, Paul says it's the word of faith that welcomes God to you, a God to work. Sorry, let me start again. It's the word of faith that welcomes God to go to work and set things right for us. This is the core of our preaching. Say the welcoming word to God, Jesus is my master, embracing body and soul, God's work of doing in us what he did in raising Jesus from the dead. That's it. You're not doing anything. You're simply calling out to God, trusting in him to do it for you. That's salvation. With your whole being, you embrace God setting things right. And then you say it out loud. God has set everything right between me and him. I love the simplicity of that. Just embracing body and soul, God's work of doing in in us what he did and raised Jesus from the dead. And just saying, he's done it. He's made everything right between me and him. Some of you will never experience victory because you've never made that decision to say yes to the invitation. Some of you have said yes to the invitation, but you're never going to experience victory. And you say, what do you mean, Steve? I've done that. I've said I've surrendered my life to Christ. You're not going to experience victory if all you've done is said yes to salvation. Because victory calls for you to walk into the invitation of a deep relationship. You see, so often people think, okay, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven, that's it. And friends, you will not experience victory if that is all you see your salvation as. God is not interested in you preoccupying your life with going to heaven. God is interested in you preoccupying your life with knowing him. And it's in knowing him. It's in moving in this invitation to where you know and are known that we actually find the, the meaning to our life, the mission of our life, the purpose for what we are called to do. You don't know him. And sometimes we don't know him. We just know, don't do the bad stuff. And friends, moving to this is so much more significant 
than trying to wrestle with this. There's four things that are involved in taking this invitation and come and know me. Walk wisely, renew your mind, and intimacy with God. Come and know me. Thanks. You guys can, you've been great. Thanks. You can go rest your legs now. Come and know me. As we think about this invitation, I am 100% convinced that if this becomes what we focus on, this fails. This loses its power. Come and know me. Step into a relationship. Yes, he wants you to be saved. God's glad that your sins are forgiven and that you're going to heaven, but primarily God wants and desires your heart. He desires a relationship with you. He desires for us to have his word, his ways, and his character change us and transform us. We recognize, and we talked about this last week, that there is a need for worth in our lives. There is a need for love. There is a need for us to be fulfilled. There is a need for us to experience happiness and purpose and significance. And all of these things our ancient enemy exploits so that he can bury us. But the thing is, is that you and I need to recognize is that we were made by and for God and nothing on any other path can fulfill your heart and satisfy you in the way that God who made your heart can satisfy you. That's the invitation that we're called to. This invitation of knowing God, where we find our worth, where we find that we can trust him. James 1, 13 to 15. We read this last week. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. But look at what comes next. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Do not be deceived. We think so often, and I love, how, I love how James draws this out, when it comes to the good things in our lives, the desires that we have that in and of themselves are not bad, it is when they're fulfilled away from God that death, that sin happens. Don't be deceived. The good, he says, every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Amen? Do you understand this? Like this invitation, this invitation is to a place where everything we need, everything we desire, significance, purpose, fill in the list. God's like, I got it for you. Every good and perfect gift comes from above. So why would we be tempted when the invitation is where we need to move to? The invitation isn't just getting God's best. It's getting God himself. And if you set your compass of heart, purpose, and mind toward I want to know God, I am 100% convinced you will find yourself having a different conversation when it comes to temptation. If that becomes our desire, the invitation to know God, and we lock into that, when it comes to that other door, the conversation changes completely. Because the invitation, although not easy, It's so much more fulfilling, so much more life-giving. Think about this. Think about how much more we have than Adam and Eve. Some of you are going, you've got to be kidding me. 
I mean, they had the garden. They had everything, right? It was beautiful. There was no sin. They had, like, it was just, like, imagine just how beautiful it was. But I'm, I believe we have it better. And here's why. When the tempter came, when the ancient enemy came to Eve and said, God's holding out on you, she's like, maybe he is. Friends, when our ancient enemy comes to us and says, God is holding out on you, we know he's lying, yes, because we know what Eve didn't know. We know in our story there's a cross. We know how far God will go to rescue us, what he will do to bring us back. Eve did not know that. She didn't know how far God would go to rescue her. And listen to this. We sang this. Before I spoke a word, you were singing over me. You have been so good to me. Before I took a breath, you breathed life into me. You have been so kind to me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. It chases me down, flights till I'm found, leaves the 99. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. When I was your foe, you still fought for me. You've been so good to me. And then it goes on. And I love this. There is no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down. Coming after me. I mean, here's the thing that you and I have when it comes to this invitation to know God. He, look what he did to rescue you. Look what he did to come after you. That's your story. And he invites you into this relationship. This invitation through this door is also to walk wisely. Yes, not only to come and know me, but to walk wisely. Romans 13, 14 says, But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. This is an invitation to know God deeply. It's also an invitation for us to walk wisely. Every one of us get dressed in the morning, and Paul's language here is so practical. And again, in Christ, Christ in me. I just put on Christ. Be focused on the things of Christ. And make no provision. Some of you, if you're going to experience victory in your life, this invitation to know God and to walk wisely, if you're going to experience victory, you've got to change environments and probably relationships. There are environments that are just bad for you. For some people that experience addictions, and this is some of the things that, like, if this pattern of sin and and temptation runs enough times in a certain area, we will be come to this place where we are, where we experience addictions that we just don't want. And the thing is, is that sometimes to break out of this, we got to change the environments that we allow ourselves to go in. We have to stop making provision for us to move away from the invitation and, st- and walk through the door of temptation. And I don't know what that is for you. But if you find yourself struggling, move to the invitation and be aware. Be aware of your environment. Be aware of the relationships that you have. And choose to change your story. I think one of the biggest things that we can do when we are struggling and I'm not even talking about struggle. I'm just talking about walking in this invitation, period, is to have somebody that walks with us, somebody that knows you, somebody, 
And I, and I hesitate to use the word accountable because accountable, I, I'm tired of, oh, I have an accountability because as soon as you think accountability, it's they're up here and I'm down here and I'm accountable to them. No, I think I've talked about this here before. Firefighters are trained in what accountability really looks like. Every time a firefighter goes into a fire, they have somebody that they're accountable for. They know that as they go into this, I don't leave without him. He, I, am, I am accountable for him. He's not accountable to me. That's accountability. Do you have, if we're going to experience this invitation and, and learn to walk wisely, do you have somebody in your life that will fight with you and for you? Someone that will fight with you and for you. I think so often we, you think about the doorways and God provides a way to escape. And sometimes we go through the door and I think as we keep moving through, the doors get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. It's like, okay, now there's another way to escape. It's a little harder, but I can still get out. If you find yourself in that place, who, who, Who's the person right now that you could think of that as you're looking at that last door, it's like, okay, send, help me, help me. Who's the person who will fight for you and with you? Who is it? We have to walk wisely. If you don't have that person, look for them. Ask them. Renewing your mind. Walk what can come and know me. Walk wisely. Renew your mind. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. We did a whole series on this last summer. There are some great books. I would recommend uh, Greg Groeschel's book, Winning the Battle for Your Mind. I would recommend Lou, Lou Giglio's book, Don't Give the Enemy a Seat at Your Table. But this invitation to to where we move to this and not temptation, we really do have to renew our minds. Because a lot of people, for example, you see yourself as worthless. And I said this a couple of weeks ago. If you see yourself as worthless, it means that you do not see yourself worthy of love. And I'm absolutely convinced that if we could in a way just... In, in complete darkness and just see lights falling, a beam of light falling on every individual here that does not see themselves worthy of love, we would be shocked at what we see. Because it's a common thing for so many people. And for us to move in this invitation, we need, for so often, it starts with this renewal of, I'm not worthless, I'm worth loving. I am not worthless. Jesus loves me with a reckless love. It takes 21 days, 21 days to change an attitude, three to six months to change a behavior. For 21 days, if you renew your mind, each day you wake up and you go, I'm not worthless, I'm worth loving. I am loved and you let that new neural pathway create in your mind that you know it. I'm not, it's, I'm not believing that lie that causes me to move to that door anymore. I'm believing what Jesus says, what he says, what God sees in me. And start renewing the mind. That's what this invitation involves. An intimacy with God. Intimacy with God. My sheep hear my voice, Jesus says, and I know them, and they follow me. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. As you sit here today, if Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior, do you know him? Do you know his voice? Are you developing a relationship with him to the place? Because that's this invitation. 
That is part of walking through this door. Where we develop this place, we develop this relationship, and we know what's involved in developing intimate relationships, right? Every person here that has a spouse, every person here that has a significant other in their lives, you know what's involved. And we think so often when it comes to my relationship with Christ that, nah, I don't have to do that. If we don't work on this intimacy piece where we know his voice, how do we follow him in this instead of temptation? How do we follow in the invitation? It's been quite a journey for me. I think, uh, oh gosh, when was it, Kevin? April 21? When I hit the wall? Um, I had somebody ask me, what's the most significant spiritual practice that you've had in your life? And I have to say, coming out of where in April of 2021, where I was like, I'm done, (laughs) I am gone, to where I am now, it is this part of growing in the intimacy with Christ through daily practices of solitude, silence, and prayer. Where I'm learning in ways, <clears throat> I'm 58 years old. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> Not as old as some people at the back that I won't call out their names, but for the first time in my life, I'm experiencing uh, yeah, an intimacy that I have not known before. It is allowing me to walk slowly in life while everything else just seems to be crazy around me. And I love it. It's not easy. But this verse... I'm finally learning it. I know him. I know know his voice. Priscilla Shire uh, was talking about this intimacy piece. And she was talking about zebras. Have you ever, like, when you look at a zebra, they all look the same, right? I mean, it's like, like I've, okay, I've actually studied pictures of zebras going, how do you tell them apart? (laughs) Like, it's like, okay, there's this one. Their stripes are the same. Like, how do you know which one's your mother? Like, how do you know, like, you know, I I don't, like, it's just weird. So Priscilla Shire was talking about this in relation to intimacy with with Christ. And she says, "When when a young zebra, when it's born, the mother takes the zebra away, the baby zebra. Two reasons. First of all, because the males want to kill them. So it's for their own survival. But secondly, although their stripes can be identical, on every zebra, the pattern on their head is different. And so the baby gets to know her mom's face, his mom's face. He gets to, he or she, the baby, gets to go, oh, when he goes, and then when he gets reintroduced back into the herd, it's like, Where's mama? Where's mama? No, 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 no. Oh, there she is. Because I know her face. I know her face. That's our call. To know his face. To know his voice. So that everything else that's screaming for our attention, we can go, no, 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 no. That's him. That's the good shepherd. I know him. He knows me. And I know his voice. Friends, this is the invitation we have. The question I have when it comes to deep clean, when it comes to experiencing victory in our lives over sin, sin that darkens and damages us and damages the relationships around us, damages what God, remember, Our ancient enemy, his whole desire is to bury you. That's it. And God, Jesus says, I have come that you'd have life 
and have it to the full. Do you know him? Will you choose to move in this intimacy, to move in this invitation of knowing him? Kelly and Kelly are going to come, and they're going to lead us in a song. And the song, it's a newer version of just turn our eyes on Jesus. And I'm going to ask you, Kelly, maybe if you could just play for a few, just for a brief while. And I'm going to ask you just to where you sit, just in your life today, where do you need to turn your eyes, your attention to his face? Maybe there is a darkness in your life, a sin, a habit that is just stopping you from walking in this invitation that we're called to. Is today the day that you decide to move into this, to do the work, to surrender, to know God, to walk wisely, to renew your mind, to grow in intimacy? And if you're going to go, yeah, today's the day, let someone know. Someone that's with you, that will fight for you. So you're not trying to do this alone. Because I am 100% convinced that if we can be like these little baby zebras and just go, no, 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 there, that's, that's that face. That's my mom. That's my Lord. And I'm going there. I'm not distracted by everything else. I'm convinced if we do this, that this doesn't win. The invitation does. So I'm going to ask you just to quietly just reflect. And then I'm going to ask us to stand. And we're going to sing this together as a prayer. And then I'm going to ask Lloyd Robinson to come and pray for us as we are dismissed.
I think um, just the last there, oh Jesus, turn our eyes on you. It it takes an action, an action is required, right? We can continue uh, to go through the doorway of temptation, but we do have an invitation, and not only an invitation to not be tempted or not sin, but a t uh, an invitation for salvation. And again, with salvation doesn't mean everything's perfect and that there's things that we can't do, but God has chosen to to give us these limitations so we may have a better life because he created us and he created <clears throat> excuse me he created us 
to turn to him, right? He's given us a way. So let's just pray this morning. Father, we thank you uh, for the way. We thank you uh, that you love us, that you gave us salvation, that you gave us hope, that you gave us grace. And in that, Father, we, we thank you uh, that you have chosen us, that you created us in your image, Father, and that it's not about not doing, uh, but doing what you have asked us to do, Father. And in that, there is freedoms. We thank you that you love us. You love us so much that you set up parameters, the parameters that keep us safe in you, Father. And that, and even in this song, it talks about eternity. It talks about the end game, and it is heaven and spending time with you. And we are so thankful that we get to spend eternity with you. Father, we just think so much, um, I think this morning, about the zebra and how the, the mother actually has to take the baby away and i think sometimes we forget we get so caught up father in um, our everyday life and our turmoil and our our the enemy pouring in and the temptations father that we forget to take time away with you and refocus and get to know who you are our father and how you love us so deeply father and help us just to know you better Lord, and it's not about r religion, but relationship. And we thank you that you want relationship with us. Father, you are good. You are a good, good Father. And we just ask that you would just remind us about the difference between temptation and the invitation that you gave us. For you are good, Lord, and you are there waiting for us to come back. You are waiting uh, for us to come and reunion and to reunite with you. And we thank you for that. We thank you that you have grace for when we do slip up and we go through that doorway of temptation, Father. You don't expect us to be perfect, but you are there to pick us up when we fall. And we are thankful for that. We just ask for blessings this week. We thank you uh, for these kids at camp and the time that they have, have given um, this summer, Father, uh, for teaching other kids about you. And I just ask you to bless them this week. We think of joy, graphite, and the kids, uh, the camps around the area. Father, we are blessed to have that. We ask you to bless them this week. Bless each one here as we are all in so many different circumstances and how we're going about our lives, Lord. But you are there walking with us, and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen.